the easiest star to observe at the time, was actually an A-type star, according to the spectral classification scheme that was operated at the time. Now, subsequently, other white dwarfs were discovered. A well-known one is Van Marnen II, identified in 1913, which is an isolated white dwarf. Uh, and in 1915, Adams uh, published uh, a first attempt to get a spectrum of Sirius B uh, in the publications of the Astronomical Society of the, specific, of, of the Pacific. Uh, and that was the realisation bringing all that information together, that these objects had rather small radii, um, but were actually having containing in those radii stellar mass material, which broke all the then known laws of physics. So we had stars with massive surface gravity, 10 to the 4 times that of a normal star, but also unfeasibly high density. So the story moves on really into the 20th century, uh, and the advent of what was, to that group of astronomers, new physics, quantum theory uh, and the theory of stellar structure. And there are many well-known people who contributed to that. Carl Schwarzschild, Arthur Eddington, a gold medalist of this society, uh, Art Fowler, Paul Dirac and Wolfgang Pauli, all built up the physics that Subramanian Chandrasekhar eventually built into his introduction to the study of stellar structure. And I still have my rather battered copy. It's not an original. I wish it was. But it's seen life. It's a copy that I bought when I was an undergraduate student. Uh, and in that book, he provides a seminal analysis of what a white dwarf star is. It's actually a very small, thin chapter at the very end of a lot more material. But in fact, it's one of the great results when he predicted the maximum mass that a white dwarf could have, the maximum mass for degenerate matter supporting a stellar envelope of 1.44 solar masses. So we now know, in the mid-20th century, what white dwarfs are. But what does that really mean? Uh, uh, Leo Mastel is another gold medalist of the Society, uh, somebody I have got to know quite well over the years. Sadly, I don't see so much anymore but was a bit of a mentor to me when I, as a young fellow of the society, was starting out studying white dwarfs. And he looked at how these apparently dead objects would cool. So a white dwarf is an object with no nuclear burning going on in its interior. So you have a hot object initially, and it just cools down, radiating its energy into interstellar space. And he developed this theory of white dwarf cooling, demonstrating that white dwarfs cool exponentially over billions of years and actually uh, over much of the lifetime of the universe. Uh, that was refined by Hamada and Solpeter a few years later, and in the intervening time, more physicists and astronomers have added more sophisticated physics around differentiation of the structure of the core, around the composition of the envelope. But the basic theory remains and has become very important, uh, and I'll describe a little bit more about that in a minute or two. But to actually do real astronomy, you need decent samples of stars. And in the 1950s and 60s, astronomers like Leuton, Glickless and Greenstein carried out proper motion surveys looking for these very faint objects called white dwarfs. Uh, and in the 70s and 80s, we had the Palomar Green Survey followed by the SDSS, which were looking for blue objects, not actually really looking for white dwarf stars, but looking for boring things like distant galaxies and blue objects in general. But as a byproduct, find very large numbers of white dwarf stars that we can then go on to study. Um, theories of the understanding of their envelopes were developed by Jesse Greenstein and Harry Shipman and Detlef Custer in the 1970s that gave us the tools to start to understand the physical structure of these objects. And those are the tools that I've used through most of my career since the early 1980s to actually try my best to understand what white dwarfs are and what they're doing. So one of the fundamental things that we can measure about any white dwarf is its mass and radius. Uh, and Chandrasekhar predicted a, a relation between the mass and radius that's quite simple and independent of temperature. Uh, and so if you can measure some of these physical parameters, if you know the radius, you can work on the cooling of the white dwarf. I don't know if there's a laser on this. I hope there is. It doesn't work. Okay. So I'll just have to leap around a little bit then. So 
So this is a plot of a uh, Hertzsprung Russell diagram, effectively, a colour magnitude diagram. Uh, the main sequence is in the top right hand corner. Uh, and in the centre and the bottom left is the white dwarf cooling sequence, derived from the theory of Leon Mastel and the people who've refined it subsequently. Uh, and the white dwarf cooling sequence is very important because the galaxy hasn't been around long enough for white dwarfs to cool beyond a few thousand degrees. So the temperature of the coldest white dwarfs is uh, a direct measure of the age of the galactic disk. So this is a very important tool for measuring ages of clusters, particular testing globular clusters where there have been anomalies in understanding the main sequence. Uh, and this work underpins our understanding of late stages of stellar evolution, which are very important for recirculating material into interstellar space uh, and for producing dust. White Horse also laboratories for matter under extreme conditions and also uh, White Horse are clearly implicated in Site 1 supernovae uh, explosions and therefore they must be a number of progenitors that include White Dwarfs. But yet we still don't really have the smoking gun that understands, thank you, that tells us really what is a supernova progenitor for Type 1A. Is it a binary White Dwarf? Is it a White Dwarf? with the main sequence companion. There is still no obvious counterparts. So there's an important need to understand the process of evolution of white dwarfs. Let me come on to Sirius B. It's a, it's a favorite object. Uh, it's the nearest white dwarf being a companion to Sirius. That's probably self-evident. Uh, but it's also very close. This is a 50 year binary orbit. Uh, so it's a very, very challenging object to observe. On the other hand, being the nearest, it ought to be the best understood if we can actually get those observations. Uh, we know the distance to Sirius A very accurately, so by implication, we know the distance to Sirius B equally. Uh, attempts have been made to get spectra from the ground. Uh, Oki, I'm not sure this one's working either. Take the USB thing out. Sorry, I should have done it. Aha. Thank you. Now it works. So Oki, and actually one that surprised me, a Japanese scientist, Kokoda Ira, who published in the publications of the Astronomical Society of Japan, a not very widely read journal, was one of the first persons to get a, quite a nice spectrum, which is reproduced here uh, from a photographic plate. The problem is, from the ground, the white dwarf spectrum is severely accommodated, uh, contaminated by scattered light from the companion. Uh, and Attempts were made to measure the temperature and the surface gravity uh, and an important parameter, the gravitational redshift, which can give you uh, another determination of the mass. But the accuracy of these was very poor uh, and inconsistent results were obtained from those. And it was only in the space age when we had access to the Hubble Space Telescope and Sirius B started to become more distant from its companion. So in the in the late 1990s, the early 2000s, it was actually as close as it could possibly get and therefore impossible to observe. But in the last uh, couple of decades, we've been able to take measurements with the Hubble Space Telescope and we first published these in 2005. Uh, and there was a lot of interest. So the European Space Agency uh, did a nice press release and produced this rather nice animation of zooming in onto the system through various media. So this is the worst resolution photographic plate that you could get with a uh, resolving power of an arc minute or so, uh, where Sirius, B, Sirius and Sirius B is totally washed out. But the exquisite imaging performance of the Hubble Space Telescope allows you to get right into the binary uh, and very clearly resolve the B component, which as we zoom in you will see. So this is Sirius B here, uh, just hiding close to the diffraction spike of Sirius A. So it's a very challenging observation. You can even see in this really nice image how much scattered light there is. And you have to orient the observation to carefully avoid being close to the diffraction spikes to minimize that scattered light component. And when you do that, this is an image of the, the visible light spectrum here, are the Barmer lines, and if I just stretch that scale, so this is Sirius B, uh, but these are the diffraction spikes of Sirius 
A, because the slit is going this direction, so you can't completely eliminate the light, but you can get really nice contrast uh, between Sirius B and the scattered light background that produces some absolutely exquisite white dwarf spectra, the best ones ever obtained of any white dwarf. And by comparing the calculations from stellar model atmosphere theory, you can fit a predicted barbell line spectrum through the observations. You can see what a nice fit this is. And you can use that to determine the temperature and the surface gravity, and then start to look at uh, measuring the physical parameters of the white dwarf itself. And there are a number of ways of doing this. The, in, the measurements are not all independent, but there are different combinations uh, that you can look at to allow you to approach a problem from slightly different angles. So for example, the, this flux equation, uh, which relates the Eddington flux to the observed flux through the R squared over D squared, i.e. the parallax, is an important measurement. The surface gravity is given by GM over R squared, all basic astrophysics. Uh, and the gravitational redshift from general relativity is given by this equation, M over R times C. So knowing some of these parameters allows you to fiddle around and feed the in, in, the interesting measurements in from various angles and extract by combining these measurements the mass and the radius of the white dwarf and this is a, a plot we did in 2005 uh, which shows the mass and the radius up the right hand side there uh, and four measurements there are two pairs each taken from the different spectra so we have longer wavelength spectra of the long wavelength Balmer lines and we have a measurement of the H alpha line uh, and then we extract these using G from the log G of the spectral fitting to get a, a, a mass radius. But we can also do that from the gravitational redshift and the normalization, the R over D squared, from the parallax. Uh, and there's quite a reasonable nice overlap here, but there's a distinct difference between the measurements taken from the log G, which tend to give a lowish mass, about 0.9, and the measurements taken from the gravitational redshift, which give us measurements between 1 and 1.1. And we couldn't really reconcile those, so we decided we would go back and get some more observations because we felt there were systematic effects in how we located the star in the aperture of the spectrograph. And we could use a combination of narrow slits to try to refine that information and remove some of those systematics. Unfortunately, the Space Telescope Imaging Spectrograph then broke uh, and wasn't repaired until 2009. But in 2013, uh, we were able to go back and get those observations, but things didn't work quite how we had hoped. We thought those measurements would come together, and we get mutual agreement between the two different techniques that we were uh, using to measure the mass and radius. So here we have the two data points from the surface of gravity, and the R over D squared, and here are the two data points from the gravitational redshift and the R over D squared. This shaded area here is a current best estimate, but not a modern best estimate, of the astrometric mass. Uh, and you couldn't get three sets of measurements that disagree more, <laughs> which is enormously frustrating. Uh, but what it does tell us that there is something we do not understand about this star, which is somewhat worrying because of the importance of the white dwarfs in doing a lot of other measurements. We do need to solve this problem. Um, at the moment, we're actually doing work on the astrometric mass. I don't have an answer for you. Whether it lies over here or over here or still in the middle, I can't say. Uh, I'm hopeful of getting the results in the next couple of months. But this is an illustration of what nice data we have with which to do that. So this is the orbit of Sirius. Here's Sirius A and Sirius B. The open circles are historical measurements going back uh, into the last century and before that. The filled dark circles are more modern measurements making from, made from ground-based telescopes in the late 20th century. Uh, and then the red dots are the measurements made using the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, and you can see how precise they are. This is the current best estimate of the orbit, uh, but we need to do work to refine the errors on that. So unfortunately, this work isn't complete, but what is really challenging us is understanding, if I just sort of go back to the previous slide, 
is, is what is going on. We have two robust ways of measuring these parameters, which are about as far apart as you could possibly get them, given the error bars. So either there is something going wrong with general relativity, which I really don't believe, uh, or there is something we don't understand about stellar atmosphere physics, which I think I'm more inclined to believe. But an important test is where we actually come out with the astrometric mass uh, and where it sits with in these results. So one of the things that's been intriguing about white dwarfs is the fact that something as massive, uh, sorry, as dense as a white dwarf, with such a strong gravitational potential, should have a very pure hydrogen atmosphere. White dwarfs come in two flavours. Uh, these plots that were kindly sent to me by Boris Gansiker, because I think they're rather nice ones, are profiles of white dwarf composition from the surface down to the interior. Uh, and so the typical cores are mixtures of carbon and oxygen. And then all white dwarfs have a helium envelope. Uh, and there are hydrogen-rich white dwarfs, the majority which also have a hydrogen envelope. If the evolution of the progenitor star goes a bit further, then that hydrogen envelope can be stripped and you're left with a helium envelope white dwarf, a so-called DB or a DO white dwarf compared to a DA white dwarf, which is a hydrogen rich. And I say those are the majority of stars. Because of the strong gravitational field, everything should sink out of the atmosphere. Uh, but that's not necessarily true. And even as far back as the early 19th century, uh, when nobody quite appreciating this, when they observed Van Maanen's star, with spectroscopically. Now, this is a modern observation of Van Maanen's star, but it illustrates very clearly that the atmosphere of this star is not pure hydrogen. There is calcium, magnesium, and iron lines. Uh, so that was measured, at, but sort of parked for about 80 years or so before people started to think about the composition of white dwarfs. And a lot of us were studying hot, hydrogen-rich white dwarfs with, the, with IUE uh, and ROSAT and the Hubble Space Telescope. And came to realise that this picture, simplified, of pure hydrogen envelopes was actually not at all true in the case of many white dwarfs. And this is a typical white dwarf. Uh, the observation is the blue histogram. Uh, a synthetic spectrum is the red one, which shows you numerous features of iron and oxygen and silicon residing in the atmosphere of the star. Uh, as we probe more and more of these stars, we realised that actually having heavy elements, metals in the atmospheres of DA white dwarfs was common. Not in every case, but was common. And we started to wonder why the materials were there. Now, because we were observing white dwarfs that were selected through surveys in the X-ray and extreme ultraviolet, we were preferentially examining the hottest examples of this. And the theories that were developed to explain what we saw were centred around radiation pressure uh, holding material uh, up in the atmosphere and stopping it from sinking down against the pull of gravity. Uh, and that works pretty well. Qualitatively, you can do the calculations. Uh, nickel and iron are many, many thousands of lines in the ultraviolet that can block radiation and give rise to the radiation pressure that supports these elements. Uh, and that seemed to be a very nice uh, explanation and came to be accepted. Uh, and we started to do surveys of modest numbers of white dwarfs, so we could observe about 20 white dwarfs with uh, the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, we could observe more, because there were plenty more, but getting time is quite difficult, so we were limited by the scale of the observations we were able to uh, get. And... The measures abundance of nickel are shown in the green diamonds and of iron shown in the blue ones. Uh, the unfilled triangles are actually the predictions of radiation theory and I'm sure it's self-evident when you look at this that, everything, that it doesn't quite work. The predicted abundances of material are rather higher than the ones we observe. And in fact, the reason I've only got one set of predictions is that because the number of lines of nickel is very similar to the number of lines of iron in the ultraviolet, is that the predicted abundance is almost exactly the same for each element. But quite clearly, it isn't. And this has been a puzzle uh, that I've been trying to solve for about 10 or 15 years. So qualitatively, the radiation uh, levitation theory works very nicely. You see white dwarfs 
with heavy elements at the temperatures which you expect to see them, but the actual abundances don't match the theory. Now, in parallel with this, the, a lot of work was going on looking at cool white dwarfs, uh, and infrared surveys came online, such as the Weiss survey, uh, and latterly the Spitzer telescope was uh, launched to be able to observe spectroscopically. Uh, and a number of white dwarfs were observed and found to have infrared excesses, which was something of a surprise. Uh, we'd already imaged a lot of these white dwarfs to look for companions and hadn't found any. But the infrared excesses are certainly not stellar. Uh, and the implication of these observations is that many uh, white dwarfs, particularly cool hydrogen-rich white dwarfs, seem to have circumstellar disks and dust surrounding them. And one particular example uh, demonstrates this in a rather nice way. So here is the uh, infrared spectrum of a white dwarf called GD56. And there's this bump, which is very indicative of some kind of dusty material close by. But when you take a, a visible light spectrum in the blue, you see absorption from heavy elements, from metals. So we started to build up some evidence that where you see infrared dust, you actually see metals absorbed by the atmosphere of the, of the white dwarf. Uh, and the idea started to arise that maybe this material is being accreted onto the surfaces of the white dwarfs that we're observing. So we see the dust arriving in the atmosphere. And because it's a continuous resupply, it doesn't sink down uh, as the white dwarf cools. So a really important a probe of this was the FUSE space mission. FUSE is a far ultraviolet mission which flew for about 10 years in the late 90s to late early 2000s. Uh, the important thing about FUSE is that it observed white dwarfs as tools for background sources for studying the interstellar medium and trying to observe deuterium in the interstellar medium. So for the first time we had a quite unbiased sample of white dwarfs from the ultraviolet part of the spectrum. Uh, the stars were drawn from several programs and so we had nice broad temperature coverage uh, one of the things we found with Hubble, if you propose to observe a white dwarf where you don't already know there were metals in the atmosphere from some other evidence, you couldn't get the observations. And so FUSE, because of this different selection criteria, has produced an extremely powerful catalogue of about 90 stars with good signal-to-noise spectra in the far UV, in which we detect many species, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, silicon, phosphorus, sulphur, uh, and importantly, the species that I've underlined here, uh, we detect in excited states in this particular part of the spectrum. The problem with uh, detecting uh, ground state transitions is that they can be in the interstellar medium. So the nice thing about these is that they can only be seen if the material is actually in the stellar atmosphere because you have to have hot and dense material for that, those lines to be visible. Uh, and this plot shows a fraction of white dwarfs in that sample of stars where we detect these species. So green is carbon, uh, blue is silicon, red is phosphorus, and the purple is sulphur. And you can see that across the entire temperature range from about 20,000 degrees up to 70,000 degrees, we see quite a high proportion of stars that show metals in their atmospheres. It does decline which is what you might expect as radiative levitation forces do diminish. But if radiative levitation is the only mechanism, it should decline much more steeply. And in fact, below about 35 to 40,000 K, you should stop seeing those metals. And in fact, you don't. OK. I won't send that. And I'll get back to the slide. Don't you just love PowerPoint sometimes? <laughs> so this is a, a plot showing the carbon abundance uh, as a function of effective temperature of the white dwarf. Uh, 
Uh, the diamonds are the measurements with error bars. These two curves here are predictions from radiative levitation calculations that predict what sort of abundance you should see. Uh, and quite clearly, so it covers an envelope of surface gravity that is typical of a sample. So all our measurements should lie between these two lines. Uh, well, about one measurement lies between the two lines. That's probably just chance, I suspect. So there's no agreement whatsoever between the predicted abundances and the abundances that we measure. And if we look at silicon, uh, we find a similar effect. Although silicon behaves slightly differently under radiative levitation, still all the data points should lie between the two curves, uh, and the majority don't. And I think there's just no correlation at all here. Uh, and the fact that some data points lie in here is just the fact that there, there's just a space to fill with data points. So that doesn't tell you very much. The, the really interesting thing to do is to then take the ratio of carbon to silicon. So carbon and silicon are ubiquitous in almost every astrophysical object. So we know a lot about the ratio of carbon and silicon in various bits of the galaxy, the solar system, and the rest of the universe. Um, and if you look at the ratios, you'll see that what we're looking at is essentially material that is depleted of carbon in most cases. So the horizontal lines give you the abundance ratio for a solar mixture, for a CI chondrite, and for the bull curve. And the majority of measurements that we get sit between the chondrite and the bull curve abundance. Uh, the curves, again, are the radiative levitation predictions, just to show you where the space, the space ought to be occupied. And again, there's a pretty complete anti-correlation between that theory and the observations. So this really is a bit of a smoking gun that does pretty much demonstrate that what we're seeing is materially accreted from extrasolar planetary deadly, debris, from <coughs> dust disks, from material that's been broken up, maybe from asteroids or old planets orbiting these systems. And more recently, we've seen some very direct evidence of this. In the last week or two, people have observed transits of dusty material, of discrete pieces of material in front of a white dwarf star which really adds the icing to the cake. So I think the paradigm has changed from thinking that radiative levitation was driving what we saw in white dwarfs. We now realise that white dwarfs are actually uh, accreting material from what's left over of their planetary systems. And when we don't see material in white dwarfs, well, it means they probably didn't have much, much in the way of planetary systems to break up. Uh, and interestingly, it's rocky material that we see. So it's a particularly useful probe of rocks uh, in other stars, which we can't yet do by the other techniques that we apply to studying extrasolar planets. So the last brief topic I'm going to uh, talk about is something I find particularly exciting. As I said, I'm not an expert on this. In fact, there is one in the audience one John Webb sitting down there keeping very quiet. So if there are difficult questions at the end, I'm going to point them in his direction. But when I gave my last talk uh, about white dwarfs at an ordinary meeting, John Barrow called me at the end and he said, I really like those white dwarf spectra. They're fantastic. I think we could use them to study fundamental constant variation in strong gravity. Uh, I thought, that sounds like an interesting idea. So we went away and cobbled a bit of a scheme together and actually started to do some work on it. Uh, now, the, the interesting thing we're trying to measure is that the coupling constant that characterises the strength of the electromagnetic interaction, alpha, in some cosmological models is not constant, either with time in the universe, and that's work that John has been particularly involved in, John Webb, I mean, uh, but also doesn't necessarily remain constant as you vary gravitational fields. So in a strong gravitational field, you may see changes. How would they manifest themselves? Uh, they manifest itself in a very small but potentially detectable shift in wavelength for particular groups of atomic transitions. And the effect is higher for larger uh, mass atoms, larger atomic number atoms. So, so those stars where we observe lots of iron and nickel, an example of which I showed you, uh, is a prime object to go and look at this. Uh, one particular white dwarf, G191b2b, is very well studied. It's a useful calibration source for Hubble. So we have thousands of observations of it that we can add together to produce the best spectrum possible. 
Uh, and if we observe G191b2b, uh, we should see a spectrum that, if alpha does vary with gravity, would be different in terms of the disposition of the measured wavelengths of the absorption lines to one if alpha doesn't vary. And here's a schematic that John sent me that just illustrates that. So here's delta alpha over alpha uh, and shows it in a very exaggerated sense, because we're actually looking for rather tiny differences in wavelength, uh, how things might change. So we did the measurement, uh, and this is what we got. Uh, so what we're plotting here is something called the sensitivity parameter. You could equally plot wavelength, um, and delta lambda over lambda is the difference between the predicted wavelength of the transition and the measured wavelength of the transition. Uh, and indeed, you see a trend for the iron lines in blue, uh, but you actually see an opposite trend for the nickel lines in red. Well, clearly, they sh if there is a real effect, they should be going in the same direction. So what we're actually measuring is an upper limit, but what we're demonstrating is the potential for doing the measurement. Uh, this was done without any refinement whatsoever, taking the raw spectrum with the calibration as published from the pipeline, taking the available atomic data with notoriously unreliable uh, measurements of wavelength. And since then, we've been refining the measurements and we've, through John's good officers, working with people in NIST uh, and in Paris to try to improve the wavelength of the measured iron lines and nickel lines because that data isn't very good. It's, it's been around for about 30 or 40 years Calculations are not particularly accurate, and so you really need to pin down the wavelengths. And so this is a plot received a couple of days ago based on new laboratory wavelengths obtained by NIST, and this is delta alpha over alpha measured for this. Again, it's the, the error bar is a bit larger than the actual measurement, so it's not a detection. Um, and similarly with some uh, wavelengths from Paris. So, and a slightly different answer, but again, not a detection. And if you do that for a, a number of different sets of wavelengths, you can see there's a bit of a trend going on. So we clearly still haven't got to the, the end of the problem at the moment. We need to beat down on the errors uh, because we're not getting consistency between the data sets at the moment. Uh, and that means that we're not going to be able to provide the final answer. We also need to do quite a lot of work on the calibration, particularly the wavelength calibration, of the instrument, which is, while it's very good, is known to have some ripples in it that we need to be removed. So this is a prospect. But nevertheless, if we look at the sensitivity that we're trying to detect, we can actually predict that we will beat down on the systematic measurement errors here and actually get down to a level where we, even if we don't detect anything, we can actually provide an upper limit that actually is of interest to cosmologists and will start to constrain some of the theories. So that brings me to the end. Uh, in 160 years or so, white girls have played and still play key roles in astrophysics, and I hope I've demonstrated that in the things that I've been talking about this evening. Uh, we've learned a lot, but a lot still remains to be solved. The mass-radius relation is still, despite our efforts, proving to be a difficult problem to resolve, whether we understand that or not. If we don't understand it, how can we believe all the measurements we make about ages of the galaxy, ages of clusters and things like that? There are some new things that have come out that, whereas I thought we'd resolved much of the work during my career, surprises are still there, uh, particularly the presence of metals and the indication that we're accreting rocky planetary debris, which to me is tremendously exciting because it allows you to go back to these stars, take new observations, look for time variability, uh, and try to refine the accuracy of the abundance measurements so that you can begin to understand perhaps differential uh, compositions between different parts of the galaxy. And also, what I think is particularly exciting, and again a new angle, is using white dwarfs as laboratories for studying variation of alpha and strong gravity. Uh, we have a very exciting project <coughs> which I'm working on with John and collaborators in the audience and others. And we've got support from the Leverhulme Trust to pursue this, to try and refine the measurements that we're doing.
uh, and <coughs> hopefully pin down those measurements and maybe actually detect something. It would be fantastic if we could. But nevertheless, I think an upper limit will actually provide an important contribution to understanding our cosmology. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Martin, for, if nothing else, near perfect timing. I think we have time for a couple of quick questions. At the very back, Carol. Uh, I must uh, comment on your uh, information about the atomic data from mm. Arnold Nickel. The person who should contact is Judith Pickering, we the have. Imperial College, oh, sorry, because no. she made mm. very highly accurate measurements of the infant they use there um, specifically for testing the gravitational effect. Her data have been used, they're probably put into NIST as well, mm. and she's had very little credit for doing that work. Okay, and thank you for pointing that out. Her measurements are almost yeah. certainly the best available. Bob. Really interesting talk. Understood about what you're measuring. Yes. Uh, looking at the, the data that you've expressed, in some of the graphs, uh, ordinate was a, a log axis, so it, the measurements appear to be just off, but in fact they're off by a factor of yeah. 10, or they're too small yes. by a factor of 10 or 100. It's always confusing when you go a log axis. So, so they're way off. But, and then you saw the error bars on some of the things of, of the measurements. Uh, and it seemed to me, as a not knowing anything about this, that the errors are not in the instrumentation. Uh, by improving the, the error bars, you're still going to be measuring things that are wildly adrift. And it, the suggestion to me is, is that there's something fundamental in the physics the, uh, of, these, of this object that is far more complicated. I know you've talked about rocky debris and things. Yeah. I just yeah. don't think you're modeling the, uh, uh, the, the actual object accurately enough. I think that's what the data seems to well, it's not, it's not I th well, I think I think from if you're talking about the point of view from the point of view of the predictions of what the abundances should be, um, I think those, the the radiated levitation calculations are are pretty sophisticated. I, w I wouldn't trust them overly, but when you see orders of magnitude difference, I think it's difficult to dig, dig down into the physics understanding and find the explanation, which is why I think the rocky planet accretion hypothesis works much better. Uh, so if you're supplying material from the outside, you can control, well, the accretion is controlling the abundance and therefore it allows you to, you've got to supply the material from somewhere. Uh, and so I think radiative devastation will still happen, but it's then acting on material that's being supplied to it. I know that. And uh, that should see yeah. every close white dwarf binary in the whole galaxy. Uh, and it will resolve the orbital frequencies of many of them. And uh, if the recent ground based measurements of anything to go by, you'll get really quite precise masses mm. from those. So if you can pursue the same analysis from the spectra in white dwarf binaries, then there's mm. the hope in you know, 10 years. I was going to say it's a little bit <laughs> far ahead. But yes, you're right. I'm well aware of the, the gravitational wave interest. Okay, last question over here. Don. Martin, for your rocky hypothesis, your star was a red giant. It cleaned out its inner system. When the atmosphere left and you had the core left behind as the white dwarf, anything that could possibly be accreted is way far out. Do you have any theoretical support that that could migrate in? Yeah, the, yeah, there's a lot of work, it's not my field, but there's a lot of work done on the interaction of planets. Uh, so yes, you do clear out about to the radius, current radius of the Earth in the case of the Sun. Yeah, there's a, a debate as to whether the Earth would survive the red giant phase. But, but the red giant then disturbs the dynamics of the rest of the planetary system. And there are evolutionary paths for material to...
scatter into the inner part of the, the system after that. So there's a lot of good modelling going on that demonstrates that that's possible. Martin, thank you very much indeed. Can we all thank Martin for the evening? So, could I remind everybody that we have the usual drinks reception over in the Society Library, and could I encourage everybody to come across and we can toast the health of our retiring uh, members of council. And finally, I give notice that the next monthly ANG meeting of the Society will, will be on Friday the 14th of October. Thank you.